Okay, so good morning, everyone. First, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to give this talk. Uh, here's the outline of the talk. I'm going to start with some general uh, discussion about junctions of quantum wires and spin chains in simple cases. Then I'm going to move on to the specific Y-junction model that we study and what the fixed points are. And I'm going to show some numerical evidence for the existence of these uh, fixed points. This will be density matrix randomization group uh, results. And then at the end, I'm going to tell you how to use these Y-junctions as building blocks for two-dimensional phases. Uh, there are no trivial phases of interacting spins. That's the real program where we want to go with this idea. Uh, and this work was done in collaboration with Francesco Bucchieri and Rhino Degor from Dusseldorf. Uh, and Flavia Ramos is a postdoc here at the IIT. She did all the numerics uh, that I'm going to show at the end. And she's in the audience. <laughs> OK, so let's start with the simplest possible case, a junction of just two quantum wires. Uh, in condensed matter physics, this is known as the canyon fissure problem. So imagine that I ha we have a, a, a single local scattering potential uh, for electrons that are moving in one spatial dimension here. Uh, and this is like a single barrier that can scatter the electrons. And it, it breaks translational invariance, so it divides the wires into two regions. And uh, in 1992, uh, Kenyon Fisher uh, showed that uh, uh, defective scattering amplitude for this kind of problem renormalizes, and the renormalization depends on the electron electron interactions in the bulk. So uh, it doesn't matter if you start with a weak scattering potential or a very strong one where you just have weak tunneling between the two ends of the wires. If you have repulsive electron electron interactions in the bulk of the wires, at low energies, the effective scattering uh, amplitude always grows. It diverges, and you end up breaking the chain. That it, that's a fixed point with zero uh, conductance at low energies. <coughs> On the other hand, if you have some uh, more complicated scattering potential, like a double barrier where ca we can play with the parameters, uh, it's possible to have resonant tunneling, meaning that you can adjust the parameters of this potential so that, so that the coupling constant of this relevant operator uh, that breaks the chain is exactly zero, and then you're only left with irrelevant operators. And with this fine-tuning condition, you can have a, a, a fixed point with ideal conductance at low energies, but that requires fine-tuning. The spin chain version of this problem was studied by Eggert and Affleck in the same year. So here is the... Uh, the spin chain version of the single barrier. So you can uh, imagine that you have two spin one half chains that are coupled here by a weak link with uh, some J prime that is smaller than the exchange J in the bulk. And the, the double barrier version of this problem would be to have two weak links with a single site in the middle. And uh, like in the quantum wire problem, you can imagine that we, we know that the, the spin chain, the XXZ -X chain with in the an antiferromagnetic regime is equivalent to spinless fermions with repulsive interaction. So there is a, some relation between the two problems. And then you can show that in for a single weak link at low energies, you flow to a fixed point where the chain is broken. That's the open chain or open boundary conditions fixed point. On the other hand, if you have a single uh, or two weak links, you flow to a fixed point where the, the renormalization actually heals the breaking of the chain. And you flow to close uh, boundary conditions uh, with uh, ideal spin conductance in this case, if you like. And uh, this case is actually interesting because you can picture that what I showed you before is like a, a spin chain version of the two-channel uh, two condo model where a single sp impurity spin gets screened by the spins in the neighboring chains. And actually all the scaling behavior of the two-channel condo effect uh, works out here in this uh, spin-only problem. And I should mention that there are also uh, integral spin chains with impurities uh, that are exactly solvable by Betelsus. That's the work of Andre and Johannesson, Zwiagen and Fram, and others. Uh, so why stop at two chains or two wires? You can go to multiple wire junctions, arbitrary number n. For, the for this talk, I'm only going to talk about n equals 3. That's the y junction. And that's already enough to discuss uh, what happens uh, uh, when you apply, say, let's talk about wires. So say you apply a voltage to one of the wires and ask about what's the current that is going to flow through the other wires. 
that defines the conductance matrix where the current through uh, uh, wire alpha, alpha one, two, three here, uh, how it depends on the voltage uh, on wire alpha prime. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the uh, this matrix here, it doesn't have to be symmetric. We're actually going to be interested in the case where G uh, alpha plus one alpha is different from G alpha minus one alpha. That means that if you apply a voltage, say, to wire one, the current that goes to wire three is different from the wire two. So in this case, we're going to say that the junction is chiral because it breaks uh, a reflection symmetry that exchanges the two of these uh, uh, chains or wires. And I'm going to call this uh, the P symmetry. At the same time, uh, if this happens, the this junction breaks time reversal symmetry because, say, if you send uh, some current from wire one to wire three and you reverse time, the, the current that is coming from wire three is going to come preferably to wire two and not to wire one. So the T symmetry is also broken. And the extreme case of a chiral uh, junction would be something where the conductance from one wire to the, the next one, say, in a clockwise rotation is ideal or the maximum possible value, let's call it one in proper units, whereas to the other wire uh, it would be zero. In this case, we have uh, what we call an ideal circulator that just sends currents uh, around this uh, junction, either clockwise or counterclockwise. So the Y junction of quantum wires has been studied, and here uh, what you, you, you want to have in order to break uh, uh, P and T symmetries, you can think of having some magnetic flux through the junction here. This is this field phi, and you can have some tunneling. So this is a boundary operator that couples the different wires. So you have some tunneling with uh, the, the flux dependence here when the uh, electron hops from one wire to the next. Uh, and uh, in this paper, they show that uh, whenever you have uh, attractive electron interactions in the wires in some range that correspond to a Luttige parameter in, uh, between 1 and 3, and this magnetic flux is neither 0 or pi, so time reversal symmetry is broken, you can have chiral fixed points with asymmetric conductance uh, where this GA here parameterizes the, the uh, anti-symmetric part of the conductance uh, that would uh, depend on the on the electron electron interactions and here the the unit of conductance is the quantum of conductance e squared over h <coughs> so the main question of this talk is uh, can we get chiral fixed points with spin one half heisenberg or xxx chains uh, my first guess to this uh, question was no because like we said before uh, the the antiferromagnetic XXZ chain is equivalent to spinless fermions with repulsive interactions, and uh, the Y junction of uh, quantum wires has stable chiral fixed points for attractive interactions, so maybe this is a no go here. However, uh, the story will be that this chiral fixed point can actually be found at finite coupling, and you're going to look for it. Uh, just to give some motivation why we want that. Uh, try uh, and uh, look for this chiral fixed point. Uh, there have been some recent experiments in the context of quantum optics where people construct these nanophotonic devices and they have quantum circulators for photons. Uh, this works by having polarized light that interacts with polarized atoms. So the scattering, uh, the light matter interaction here is chiral and you can have uh, something like a waveguide where the if the light comes from the right, it, it doesn't interact with the atom and it goes through, but if it comes uh, from the left, it's uh, scattered, strongly coupled to this atom, and it goes out into some mode in the, uh, in, in, in the continuum, say. And something like this is very useful because it's some what people call an isolator, where the signal can only go in one direction. So it's very useful for uh, devices. And also recently in condensed matter, there has been a, a trend of studying spintronic systems with antiferromagnetic insulators. These are systems where you, you can have uh, pure uh, spin current transport, essentially without any charge current. And we wanted to ask if it's possible, at least in principle, to have some circulator of spin currents. What are the kinds of interactions you need for that? Uh, uh, moreover, another motivation is that this picture having circulator circulating spin currents is connected with uh, the problem of finding two dimensions or uh, three dimensional or three dimensional phases uh, that are known as chiral spin liquids. 
these are some exotic phases of matter where the, the, the interacting spin system does not break spin rotational symmetry in the ground state, but time reversal symmetry and at least one reflection symmetry is broken. Uh, this is interesting for condensed matter people because it's been shown that, say, if a phase like this is gapped, it's going to be topological, it has topological order, and has anionic excitations. Some of them might be useful for topological quantum computation. So we want to have here uh, a, a controlled analytical approach to construct uh, two-dimensional Cairo spin liquids starting from uh, junctions of quantum spin chains. <laughs> so here's the model that we study. It's uh, very simple. It's a, this wide junction of uh, spin one half Heisenberg chains. So we have uh, three Heisenberg chains, semi-infinite chains. So here the exchange coupling is J uh, running with uh, S dot S with sites J from one to infinity. And at the boundary here, the, the three chains are coupled by this three spin operator. This is a, an SU2 invariant, the triple product of these three spin operators. Uh, there is a, a coupling constant here, J chi. Uh, and so this operator does not break SU2 symmetry, but it breaks time reversal symmetry, because time reversal takes spin to minus spin, and there are three spins here. And it breaks a reflection symmetry because of the cross product here. So it breaks P and T. However, this model has a PT symmetry. It's invariant under the composition of parity and time reversal. <laughs> so we had only have only these two uh, coupling constants. But I should say that actually when you do numerics, it's a known trick for Heisenberg chains that we usually, uh, if you want to look at correlation functions, you want to kill logarithmic corrections, then you can do that by tuning the second neighbor coupling in the bulk to this magic value here. Uh, so that's actually the model that we use with second neighbor couplings. And uh, I should mention that uh, uh, there has been some recent proposal that this kind of three spin interaction can, can be realized experimentally as a flow K spin model where people take a MOT insulator and pump it with some circular polarized light. Okay, so we're going to study this model using effective field theory for uh, the Heisenberg chains. So let me just remind you how this works for a single Heisenberg chain. The spin on half chain is described by a conformal field theory with central charge C equals 1 uh, and SU2 symmetry. That's a SU2 level 1 Wesumino Witten uh, model. Uh, here's the Hamiltonian written in terms of these chiral currents uh, that represent right moving or left moving low energy modes. And uh, since this is a C equals 1 theory, you can write the, this uh, model in terms of a single boson. So uh, the JZ component here is written as a d in abelian bosonization as the, the derivative of bosonic field. Uh, and the, the transverse parts of the, the spin currents are vertex operators. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> and uh, these currents here obey uh, uh, Katsumuri, SC2 level 1 Katsumuri algebra. Uh, and uh, you we're going to write down the operators of the lattice model in the continuum limit. So here's the spin operator at side J. In the continuum, it's written in terms of the chiral currents, the uniform or smooth part. Uh, there's also a staggered magnetization. Uh, this is a dimension one half field that is written in terms of the spin one half primary field of uh, SU2 level one. <coughs> so let's now couple these uh, chains uh, with the Y junction geometry, starting at weak coupling. So for zero uh, chiral coupling, uh, what we have is just a, a Hamiltonian. The effective theory, th field theory is just the sum of these three SU2 level 1 uh, was mid witten models. And now we're going to turn on J chi and ask if the, this interaction favors the boundary conditions at the junction to change. Uh, and here at J chi equals 0, we start uh, at the fixed point of open boundary conditions. Uh, here I wrote both J right and J left, but we can implement open boundary conditions by imposing reflective uh, boundary conditions. All the currents that are going into the junction are reflected, so J right is not independent, but is related to J left by uh, this relation. It's just the analytic continuation to the negative x axis. Uh, <laughs> so in, in, in this way, the spin current vanishes at the boundary for open boundary conditions. Uh, and uh, we one can also uh, check that the spin operator at the boundary is written only in terms of the, this uh, chiral uh, currents. 
And with this, we can write down all the boundary operators that are allowed by symmetry. Uh, and uh, if we just uh, use the mode expansion for the spin operator for that three spin coupling that we, we, we call J chi, what you get is this here. So it's just the triple product of the currents in the continuum. That's a dimension three operator. It's highly irrelevant. As for boundary operators, anything with dimension greater than one is irrelevant. And actually, this one that you get to first order from the chiral coupling is not even the leading irrelevant operator. The leading one would be this dimension two operator. It's just the J dot J coupling that is time reversal invariant. So the, the message here is that all the boundary operators for uh, open boundary conditions are irrelevant. This is a stable fixed point. So at weak coupling, you turn on a small J chi, you stay uh, at the open boundary condition fixed point for sufficiently low energies, low long chains, and so on. <coughs> so now let's go to the opposite limit, which is also supposed to be simple. Let's say that the, the boundary <laughs> coupling is much stronger than the exchange coupling in the bulk. In that limit, we start by ignoring the, the, the Hamiltonian and the chains and just diagonalize the boundary Hamiltonian, which is just this uh, triple product. Here it's written, uh, here's the J chi again. And this is the uh, it's known as the scalar spin chirality operator for the three spins at site J equals one. So this is just a uh, Hamiltonian for three spins, one half. So we can just diagonalize it very easy. Easily, here is the spectrum, the energy levels. Uh, <coughs> uh, sorry. Uh, and so we have in total eight states. Uh, and uh, let's say if J chi is positive, uh, the ground state is actually doubly degenerate. It's a, it's a, a doublet here because all, all the eigenstates can be labeled by eigenvalues of the total spin uh, and the eigenvalue of chi, of its scalar spin chirality. So the ground state is a doublet with a negative chirality. These are two states. Uh, they are represented here as plus and minus. No, notice that they are complex states. In the if you fix the, the total uh, Sz, this is the, the state with Sz to total equals plus one half. This is minus one half. And they are complex states because this time reversal symmetry is broken. Uh, however, their degeneracy is, is guaranteed by PT symmetry. Here we don't have time reversal, but if we have PT, PT squares to minus one, so we have a Kramer's type degeneracy in the ground state. Uh, and, and the important point here is that uh, starting from this limit, strong coupling, the ground state uh, ha has this now an, an effective pseudo spin one half, and there is a gap of order J chi, which is large from this uh, doublet to the, the next excited state. So if you want to write down uh, an effective Hamiltonian at low energies, we're going to project our original Hamiltonian into this uh, subspace of this effective uh, spin one half at, at the junction. And that's this picture now. So this is the now the effective uh, impurity spin that we define from, this, uh, from those two states in the low energy manifold. And uh, this is the Hamiltonian that we get from the exchange coupling in the chain after projection. So now the boundary uh, is that it starts at site J equals two because J, J equals one were uh, combined to form the single central spin. And this central spin is coupled to the new boundary with some exchange coupling that's called JK here, which is smaller than the original J by a factor of three because of the projection. And uh, you know, this is uh, now very similar to a, a, a condo problem because we have a single uh, spin coupled to three chains, and it's actually a spin chain version of the three channel condo problem that has been studied for free electrons. <laughs> and, and one can show that now, starting from this model with this uh, JK that is a bit smaller, if you define a uh, dimensionless coupling, condo coupling constant, lambda K, it flows under the renormalization group. Here's the beta function to third order. And uh, from the free electron problem, it's known that this is going to flow to a, a non-trivial, non-fermi liquid fixed point at finite coupling. And the three here has to do with the fact that this is a three channel problem. <coughs> uh, so our problem now is to describe what is the fixed point that, are, that appears in this strong coupling limit. And this can be done using uh, techniques of boundary CFT as developed by Cardi and that Affleck and Ludwig apply to the multi-channel condo problem of free electrons. 
And uh, to do this, we're going to uh, follow uh, Cardi's idea that uh, conformally invariant boundary conditions can be uh, obtained from this fusion technique, where you start with uh, some known uh, boundary conditions, say open boundary conditions, and you generate new ones by fusion with the primary fields of the theory. Uh, and, and specifically for the multi-channel condo problem, the stable condo fixed points are generated by fusion with the spin one half primary fields of the Westman Witten models uh, that represent the sum of the tot of all the spin currents from the different channels. But to do this, we need to find some conformal embedding. Uh, so I'm just uh, uh, recall the, the result for two chains. So starting from two decoupled chains, what we have is uh, a model with a uh, two independent SU2 symmetries. Th those are two SU2 level one, was mean written models. So the total central charge is equals two. But uh, uh, Eggert and Affleck showed that you can use this conformal embedding where you have an SU2 level two model that represents the total spin degree of freedom. And the extra central charge, the, uh, the missing central charge of one half, or I should say, SU2 level two has central charge of three halves. Uh, it's equivalent to three Majorana uh, fermions. Uh, the, the missing central charge goes into a flavor degree of freedom that represents which channel uh, you are exciting if it's there is some asymmetry there, and that's a, a nice uh, model for our two chains. So what we had to do was to uh, proceed by analogy and find some conformal embedding for this three-channel condo problem of uh, three spin chains. So in this case, uh, for the non-interacting problem, we start from three SU2 level one, uh, uh, models that with total center charge equals three, the total spin current will give us an SU2 level three model that has central charge nine fifths, and the missing central charge is six uh, fifths, and the the CFT that fits the bill here is this uh, Z35 CFT. Uh, it belongs to a family of conformal field theories Z3P, studied by uh, Zamolodikov and Fatev, uh, and uh, also Lukyanov, that that have this additional W3 algebra. Uh, for us, what's important is that uh, the operator, operator, the primary fields of this theory are known, and the fusion rules are known. We have, we have the scaling dimensions. This is what we're going to actually use here. So then we, we generate this uh, uh, condo fixed point by fusion with the spin one half primary field in SC2 level 3. Uh, this table here is an attempt to summarize uh, the scaling dimensions that show up in the partition function. So th this is, again, Cardi's idea that we can identify the operator content of the boundary CFT by looking at the partition function on a cylinder with uh, boundary conditions A and B uh, on, on, the, uh, on the two boundaries. Uh, so this table here, uh, where this is the represents the partition function for chains of even length. So you only have a fuse where the total spin is either of the primary is either zero or one. Uh, these are the boundary conditions, A and B. So say this is open, open boundary conditions. And the one we're interested in here is the condo condo boundary conditions obtained by double fusion. Uh, and the scaling dimensions of the, the fields would be the sum of the uh, scaling dimension of the the primary in the SU2 sector, that's this number at the top, and the numbers in this table are the scaling dimensions of the, the fields in the Z35 theory that represent the flavor sector. Uh, the important point here is that, say, if you look at this line, in the singlet sector, we have uh, two, uh, 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 dimension three fifths uh, primary fields. Uh, however, these are this would be the the fields with the lowest scaling dimension. However, we can show that if you have a Z3 symmetry that corresponds to cyclic fermentation of the chains, uh, we can rule out these operators because they, they are not invariant under this uh, Z3 permutation. So this rule out these uh, uh, operators, which would, actu would actually be relevant boundary operators and destabilize the condo fixed point. We need a Z3 symmetry to stabilize it. And then if you rule them out, the next oper boundary operator that perturbs the condo fixed point uh, in, in on this uh, uh, represented here in this table is this dimension 8 fifths field. So we know the boundary operators allowed by symmetry. They are uh, summarized here. So the leading one is actually a, a Katsumuri descendant of the spin one primary field. This is the exactly the same uh, that uh, uh, 
uh, Affleck and Ludwig found for the three-channel condo problem of free electrons. However, and, and this one doesn't act in the Z35 sector, the flavor sector. However, the next one, ah, and this one is time reversal invariant. Uh, however, the next one, which we can show is, is time reversal odd, so it's important for the chiral properties that we're looking for. Uh, it's the dimension way eight fifths field of the Z35 CFT. And again, all these scaling dimensions are gr greater than one, so all the boundary operators are irrelevant. The condo fixed point is stable if we have Z3 symmetry. So to summarize what, what I've told you so far, uh, we looked at, uh, at this model in the limits of very small uh, JKI or very large JKI. At a small JKI, we found that uh, open boundary conditions are a stable fixed point. At large JKI, we have this uh, three-channel condo fixed point. Uh, and actually, in both limits, the fixed points we found are time reversal invariant. So neither of these are chiral, so they're not good for what we're looking for. Uh, and uh, they at, at those fixed points, P and T symmetries are restored asymptotically at low energies. So what I'm going to uh, try to convince you for the rest of the talk is because we know that the boundary condition has to change at some critical value of JKI, perhaps this critical point will be described by an intermediate fixed point that could be a, the chiral fixed point that we're looking for. Okay, so how do we find or describe this chiral fixed point? Uh, if you have SU2 symmetry, this chiral fixed point has to be written as a condition for the SU2 uh, currents that is uh, uh, that corresponds to, to this picture here, where say the the right movers on this chain are the analytic continuation of the left movers in the other chain. So this just sends this uh, spin currents uh, around in rotation, uh, either clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on the sign of JKI uh, in this junction. <coughs> uh, and uh, th this kind of fixed point we can actually also describe using the same conformal embedding. Uh, it's the, the corresponding boundary condition is found by fusion with one of the Z3, G, Z3 charge fields in the Z3-5 sector, the one with dimension 1 over 9. There are actually two of them, as there should be, because there are two chiral fixed points, either rotated in one way or the other way. Uh, and that's this line, this table. Uh, and notice here that in this table there, is, there are some operators, three operators with scaling dimension 1 half. Those would be relevant operators. And actually, it's uh, uh, easier to interpret what this means using abelian bosonization. We can write down this uh, relevant perturbation of the chiral fixed point as some Z3 symmetric uh, combination of uh, cosine fields with scaling dimension one half. What this represents is simply backscattering of the spin currents when they are when they hit the boundary here. That's a perturbation allowed by symmetry in this case, and it's relevant. Which means that if we want to find this chiral fixed point, we actually need some fine tuning to kill the coupling constants of this relevant operator. Uh, and uh, there is an interpretation for what happens when this, this coupling constant goes through zero, because if this boundary operator is relevant, it flows to either lambda equals plus infinity or minus infinity. And in those limits, it would pin the bosonic fields at the boundary. And those two possibilities of pinning this, the minimum of the cosine at either 0 or pi, model 2 pi, correspond to different boundary magnetizations. So say for negative lambda, which we can check is what happens at weak coupling, uh, the boundary, uh, the magnetization, or the total spin as that near the boundary would be an integer. The simplest possibility is 0 here. Whereas at strong coupling, uh, when you get positive lambda 1, uh, the, the boundary magnetization should be a uh, half integer. So let's say the simplest possibility is one half. So I if this chiral fixed point exists, it sits exactly at the, at the, the separation between a regime where you have uh, uh, zero or one half uh, uh, spin at the boundary. And remember, this is exactly what we have at the two limits. Uh, at open boundary conditions, you have no spin at the boundary, uh, whereas at strong coupling, we have an open, uh, sorry, a condo fixed point that corresponds to a screening of a, a spin on half impurity uh, at the uh, at the junction. So this gives some interpretation for uh, what this chiral fixed point 
uh, could be, where it could show up. Uh, just a check that we can do, uh, we can calculate the boundary entropy uh, for the, the proposed uh, uh, fixed points. <coughs> so uh, this is uh, sometimes called the Affleck-Ludwig boundary entropy. Uh, uh, they, they show that if you take the partition function of, uh, of the system with some boundary conditions and expand it in the limit of large system size and large uh, inverse temperature, but uh, in this uh, uh, scaling region, the first term is of order L, and the next one is an order one term. There is a logarithmic, a logarithm of uh, a G, and this G is known as the ground state degeneracy, which can be, in principle, any number, doesn't have to be an integer. Uh, and we can calculate this ground state degeneracy from the boundary state of the boundary CFT. And uh, for open boundary conditions, this G would be one. Uh, for condo, it's also known, the three-channel condo problem, this is the value about approximately 1.6. And for the chiral fixed point, uh, this is two. And it's important that uh, the, the uh, ground state degeneracy of the chiral fixed point is larger than the other two because there is a so-called G theorem uh, uh, that says that uh, uh, this G should always decrease under the randomization group flow as you move away from this unstable uh, fixed point. This is a sort of a uh, generalization of the homological state theorem to boundary problems. Uh, and also, it's interesting to note that uh, the value of the boundary uh, entropy for the chiral fixed point is the same as the one uh, of the double barrier problem in the Kenny Fisher problem that I mentioned at the beginning, where there you had some interpretation that this uh, uh, unstable point that we reached by fine tuning corresponds to electron hopping in and out of the island, so you get perfect conductance. So here, perhaps you can think of this chiral fixed point as the system not knowing whether it wants a zero or sp well, uh, spin zero or spin on half at the boundary, so the spin at the junction can fluctuate and you, you could get some ideal spin conductors from one uh, chain to the next. And so, uh, assuming this uh, uh, chiral fixed point exists, how are we gonna uh, look for it numerically so we can compute uh, some correlation functions. Uh, we looked uh, especially at this one. This is a three-spin correlation that uh, involves this triple product for spins in different chains, but at the same distance x from the boundary. Uh, <coughs> uh, within the, the boundary CFT, this is, this is like cal calculating on one-point function, uh, and at the chiral fixed point, this one-point function is non-zero, because time reversal symmetry is broken, and uh, this correlation, this three-spin correlation should decay as a parallel with exponent three halves, where this three halves is just controlled by the scaling dimension of the staggered magnetization in the bulk. And also oscillates as a function of distance. Uh, on the other hand, at the open boundary conditions or uh, three-channel condo fixed points, uh, there we have uh, 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 restore time reversal symmetry. So to get a non-zero result for this correlation, we have to do first order perturbation theory in the leading irrelevant operator that is odd under time reversal symmetry. Uh, and if you do that, you can show that the correlation is going to decay as uh, also as a power law, but the exponent here now depends on the scaling dimension of the, that boundary operator that I, I told you about before. And here's the scaling dimension of the uh, one of the, the, the leading uh, time reversal odd operator in the Z35 sector for condo. Okay, so here is the numerical result. Uh, uh, so Flavia does this uh, density matrix randomization group calculations. Uh, and uh, there is a method for doing that with uh, for Y junctions. Uh, first, we follow the method by Guo and White that works efficiently for uh, you can put interaction at the junction, but you need to have open boundary conditions at the far end of the finite chains. And one thing we looked at was at the finite size gap, uh, here defined as the, uh, the energy difference between uh, the ground state energy or in a sector with total spin as z equals zero and the total spin as z equals one, because we know that if the system is in near the open boundary condition fixed point, this difference is just the uh, singlet triplet gap and it should uh, uh, be given by uh, pi times the spin velocity divided by L. Uh, whereas at the condo fixed point, when you have condo boundary conditions at the junction and open boundary conditions at the far end, we know that the ground state is a triplet, so this uh, difference should be uh, 
uh, exactly at zero. So here is the, the result for this uh, finite size gap. We scaled by system size for different uh, chain lengths now. Uh, and you can see that here, uh, at uh, weak coupling, this is approaching a constant value that agrees very well, uh, trust me, with 5V. Whereas at large uh, J chi, this is there is actually a level crossing here beyond which this is exactly zero. That's where the ground state is a triplet. So we look for the the chiral fixed point or the critical point uh, uh, for this problem uh, uh, as the as the the crossing of these lines uh, when we increase uh, system size. So this gives an estimate of J chi critical of approximately 3.1. Uh, so then we go ahead and compute the three spin correlations uh, uh, for three representative values of JK. A small one that represents open boundary conditions, uh, a very large one, eight, that represents the condor regime, and uh, and this uh, the value that is the estimate for the the critical point that should correspond to a chiral fixed point. So here are the correlations, uh, and one thing you notice is that at this critical value, that's the red curve. The three spin correlation uh, is much larger than all the other values at, uh, at the weak coupling or at strong coupling. So that already tells us that uh, the chiral correlations are much stronger at intermediate coupling. But uh, so uh, uh, here is the same curve, just rescaling uh, the, the, the weak coupling and strong coupling results by a factor of 10. So they look more or less the same. And uh, perhaps you can see that uh, not only is the uh, critical, uh, the correlation at the critical point larger in magnitude, but it also decays more slowly, has the smallest exponents uh, among those we calculated. And then these are these values which are uh, in decent agreement with the predictions from the CFT, just by feeding the numerical data to, to parallel decays. Uh, and uh, I started by t uh, talking about uh, transport. Uh, so uh, let me just say a few words about the spin conductance of this Y junction. So the spin conductance here can be calculated using a Kubo formula that uh, just depends on the current current correlation function here, the spin current written in the continuum limit uh, in this way. Uh, it's a dynamical correlation function, depends on the, uh, here's the time dependence. Uh <laughs> and uh, this measures the conductance from uh, chain alpha prime to alpha uh, when the, the perturbation is along the B direction in spin space and the response in is in the A direction. So because we have SA2 symmetry, the AB dependence here, the, the spin is in that comes out is always in the same direction that is injected, so this is diagonal in spin space. Uh, and you can go ahead and calculate the, this conductance matrix for at the chiral fixed point using the the, uh, the boundary conditions, and the result is this, which basically means that all the current that goes into the junction uh, comes out either to the left or to the right, or clockwise or counterclockwise propagation. So this fixed point realizes an ideal quantum spin circulator. And here the units of the conductance are here in, in terms of quantum of uh, spin conductance. Uh, and this is also something you can check numerically with the MRG. So in this case, uh, although the, the Kubo formula depend, uh, involves a time-dependent correlation function, uh, it has been shown that if you, if you have conformal symmetry, you can reduce the problem to the calculation of a static correlation if you have this geometry with the same boundary conditions at both ends of a strip. So that's a different kind of the, the MRG method uh, that Flavio uh, developed. Uh, and uh, in this case, this is the result, uh, the, the DMRG result for the spin conductance uh, for finite chains as, as we vary J chi. So the important point here is that there is a peak in the conductance uh, that is close to the maximum value here, and, and this is close to the, uh, the same uh, critical point that we identified from three spin correlations. So this is the numerical web, and this is a really an ideal spin circulator. Okay, so very quickly, let me just uh, mention something I'm currently working on with Gabriel. The idea uh, from here would be to use these Y junctions uh, as building blocks, because now we can take several of these and put them together to construct networks in two dimensions or in three dimensions, and ask what are the two-dimensional uh, phases that you get from this kind of construction. So just from the pictures I've shown you so far, you can see that if I connect several Y junctions in this way, this forms a, a 
a honeycomb lattice of Y junctions, and the, the spin currents are going to circulate in loops in the bulk. This would be a two-dimensional phase that has a gap in the bulk because the currents uh, go around in a, in a finite size loop. Uh, on the other hand, there is a, 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 an edge mode that runs here uh, along the entire boundary of the system. This is uh, equivalent to some kind of fractional quantum Hall phase of bosons known as the kalmar loughlin chiral spin liquid. Uh, and I'd like to contrast this with uh, there are some couple chain constructions that are known in the liter literature as a method to construct topological phases by coupling parallel chains. And in that case, you usually have to assume some strong, some flow to strong coupling where you gap the, gap the modes in the bulk. What we have here is some kind of uh, coupled chain constructions, but not parallel chains. We're coupling them at the boundaries and using the boundary CFT. And in this case, we don't have to assume any flow to strong coupling. You can study the properties of the system in the bulk by analyzing the finite size spectrum of these modes in the loops. And there are many different possibilities here. Oh, just one thing is that uh, if you actually, here the gap would be of order one over L. If you uh, shrink the chains and extrapolate this to the small L, what you would get is uh, actually the, the Kagome lattice where th there is some very uh, 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 good numerical evidence for the existence of uh, a, a, a gapped chiral spin liquid, exactly this Kalmar Laughlin uh, one, uh, for the Heisenberg model on the, uh, on the Kagome lattice with additional three spin interactions. And there are other possibilities for playing around with these networks. So in the, the first example, I talked about the geyser having uniform chirality. Uh, all the currents are go around the junctions in the same direction. But you since this is uh, a uh, uh, honeycomb lattice of, uh, of junctions, it's bipartite. You can think about the, the st uh, staggered case where you alternate between positive and negative chirality at the junctions. And in this case, you just follow the directions of the, the spin currents. And you would see that uh, uh, the currents, the spin currents actually flow through the bulk instead of going around the loops. And then this, this should correspond to a gapless chiral spin liquid, which is also interesting for other reasons. It would be equivalent to some kind of spin on fermi surface state. Uh, in uh, some recent publication, we discussed al an alternative construction of, of uh, such a phase. Uh, and it showed that this spin on fermi surface state could actually be also be interpreted as a some kind of sliding Lattringia liquid, uh, uh, a two-dimensional phase of weakly coupled uh, chiral modes, one-dimensional chiral modes. <coughs> okay, uh, to summarize, uh, these are exact conclusions. So what I've told you is that uh, we found this chiral fixed point in the Y junction of Heisenberg spin chains. It's a, it appears there is a critical point in the phase diagram of this boundary problem uh, between a phase or a regime of open boundary conditions at recoupling and uh, condo three-channel condo problem of spin uh, chains at strong coupling. <coughs> and uh, at that chiral fixed point, we actually have uh, ideal, ideally chiral or maximally asymmetric spin conductance. So this uh, realizes an ideal uh, quantum spin circulator. And the idea now is to use this to construct uh, two or three-dimensional phases uh, that would uh, correspond to chiral spin liquids. Okay, thank you. <coughs>